Hi everyone, hopefully you are enjoying this series on the atom. In today's lesson, we will focus on the arrangement of the electrons around the atom. Let's cross over to Diasha and recap what we have covered so far about the model of the atom. Isn't it amazing to see how all the experimental evidence gathered by the early scientists support the models that were developed? Just think, even though the atom is far too small to see, we can have a pretty good idea of how it looks and how it behaves. These early pioneers of atomic physics pieced together data gathered from many different fields of study in order to build a more accurate picture of the atom. In this lesson, we will look at how all this evidence was finally linked together. Do you remember that in our previous lesson, we introduced the idea of quantization of energy? This theory, developed by Max Planck, showed that energy radiated from a warm body was not continuous, but broken down into discrete packets, or quanta. At about the same time that Planck was doing his important work, chemists were eagerly looking for new elements. By now, it had been accepted that elements each produce a unique line emission spectrum. And scientists, using this new technique in their work, were called spectroscopists. They noticed that there were different types of lines in the spectra. They gave these different lines names. Some lines were called sharp lines, fatter lines were called principal lines, and others were identified as diffuse and fine lines. By making careful observations of spectra, scientists were able to catalogue the line spectra of known elements, and then they began to search for different line spectra. Sir Norman Lockyer, a British astronomer, discovered helium in the most unusual way. He passed light coming from the sun through a spectrometer and noticed a line emission spectrum that was quite different to any known element. He concluded that this spectrum must be coming from an element found on the sun. He named the element helium from the Greek word helios, which means sun. At first, spectroscopists doubted Lockyer's conclusions and started to search for helium on Earth. In 1895, Sir William Ramsay isolated and identified this new element. He confirmed that the line emission spectrum from his sample and the sun were the same. While these developments were taking place in chemistry, some physicists were trying to improve on Rutherford's atomic model. They were concerned about the arrangement of the electrons around the nucleus. By this time, physics was starting to move into a more theoretical approach. Mathematical equations were generated to describe a model of the atom. Do you remember the Danish physicist Niels Bohr? Well, he was a key figure in this development. He based his model on the simplest atom, hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron and one proton. In the end, he developed a mathematical model to describe the behavior of the electron in the hydrogen atom. This model is not just a series of equations. The model can be used to explain the line emission spectrum of hydrogen. Let's take a look at a simplified version without all the mathematical equations of Bohr's model. Bohr suggested that the electron moves around the nucleus just like the planets around the Sun. The area in which the electron moves he called an orbit. Bohr's calculations showed that the electron could occupy orbits of different radii, depending on the electron's energy. He showed that when the radius of an orbit increased, an electron required more energy to remain there. He also showed that larger orbits could contain more electrons. According to Bohr's calculations, the first orbit can hold a maximum of two electrons. The second orbit can hold a maximum of eight electrons, and the third orbit can hold a maximum of up to 18 electrons. In his calculations, Bohr introduced Planck's idea about quanta of energy. According to his calculations, the orbits in which the electrons move have set amounts of energy. An electron 
could not have an amount of energy in between the allowed amounts. The energy of the electrons in these orbits is quantized. This was revolutionary thinking. Science would never be the same again. Here is a simple model to help you think about the position of the electron and the energy it has. At the top of these stairs, this ball has a high energy value. When it rolls down to the next step, it has a smaller amount of energy. The ball cannot stop in between steps. It must either be on the high step or on the step directly below. This is a way to think of the energy of the orbits, and this is where Planck's thinking helped Bohr. He figured out that the allowed energy of the orbits is quantized. It is in set amounts. No in-between amounts of energy are allowed. There are two important consequences of applying the idea of quantization to the electron. Firstly, Bohr was able to explain why electrons don't radiate energy in small amounts and eventually crash into the nucleus. An electron in a particular orbit has an exact quantum of energy. When moving around the nucleus, the electron maintains this exact amount of energy. It is not possible for small amounts of energy to leak out, as predicted by classical physics. The electron can only gain or lose energy in quantized amounts. Secondly, he could use this new model to explain the line emission spectrum of hydrogen. Let's take a closer look at how we can link Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom to the line emission spectrum. The electron occupying the orbit of lowest energy or smallest radius has a minimum amount of energy possible. The electron in this orbit is said to be in the ground state. Electrons in the ground state cannot give away or radiate out energy, but they can gain energy. This happens when an element is heated or electricity is applied to a discharge tube. When an electron gains energy, we say it has become excited. The electrons become excited by taking in or absorbing a quantum of energy. The excited electrons cannot remain in the ground state orbit, but must jump to a higher orbit. The energy an electron gains is exactly the same as the difference in energy between the ground state and an orbit of higher energy. The excited electrons are unstable in the higher orbits. They fall back down to their original orbit, but as they fall, the whole quantum of energy is radiated out in the form of light of a particular color. The energy of light is also quantized. Red light has a small quantum of energy, while light of a higher frequency, like blue light, has a larger quantum of energy. So, for example, the red line on the hydrogen spectrum corresponds to a small difference in energy between the ground state orbit and an orbit of a higher energy, while the blue line corresponds to a big energy difference between orbits. Bohr's work contributed to our understanding of the model of the atom. But was it the full picture? Let's go back to Diyasha to find out. The problem with the Bohr model was that the mathematics only worked for hydrogen, no other element. However, a new atomic model was developed using wave and quantum mechanics. Although this model was based on very different ideas, it still retained many of the principles established in earlier models. The simplest way of representing this new atomic model is by looking at an energy level diagram. The electrons are arranged in different energy levels. We represent electrons as arrows drawn in these squares that represent a single orbital. When an electron is close to the nucleus, it occupies the first energy level. The first energy level corresponds to Bohr's first orbit. When an electron has more energy, it occupies a region of space further away from the nucleus, just like Bohr had predicted. However, the quantum mechanical model does not restrict the electrons to orbits, but areas of space called orbitals. These orbitals show where electrons of particular energy are most likely to be found. Every orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. 
when two electrons are placed in one orbital, they have an opposite spin, so they do not repel each other. To show this opposite spin, we draw our arrows in opposite directions. I want to draw your attention to an important principle that Diasha has just mentioned. The reason we draw electrons in the same subshell as one arrow that points up and one arrow that points down is that two electrons in the same subshell do not spin in the same way. This is called Pauli's exclusion principle. It states that all electrons have a property called spin and two electrons in a subshell will not spin in the same way. Now, not all orbitals have the same shape. The first orbital has a spherical shape. This type of orbital is called an S orbital. The first electrons of any atom fill the first energy level and are found in an S orbital. This energy level diagram represents this model more simply. To describe this arrangement, we write down the energy level, which is 1, then the type of orbital, which is s, and then finally the number of electrons, which is 2. We write the two as superscript, r, 1, s, 2. This shorthand notation is called the electron configuration. Now, Let's move on to the second energy level. The second energy level corresponds to the second orbit. The electrons in the second energy level are further away from the nucleus. This second energy level is a little different to the first energy level. It has two sublevels. The lowest sublevel contains an s orbital. We call this the 2s sublevel. Notice it has the same spherical shape as the 1s orbital. But the second energy level has a second sublevel. In this sublevel, there are different shaped orbitals. These orbitals have a dumbbell shape. This is called a p orbital. Electrons occupying this orbital are most likely to be found in this region of space. A p orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. 3p orbitals are arranged together to hold a total of 6 electrons. Let's look at an example of an element with electrons that fill these orbitals. Oxygen has a total of 8 electrons and the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So, what would the energy level diagram look like? Well, when we fill in the energy level diagram, we must take careful note of a special rule. Each of the p orbitals gets one electron first, and only then will the next electron be paired in the first p orbital. So, oxygen has an energy level diagram with two unpaired electrons. You need to be able to state this rule that Diasha has just mentioned. It is called Hund's rule. Hund's rule states that electrons occupy subshells of the same energy individually before they share a subshell. Diasha will show us how to draw energy level diagrams for atoms that have electrons in third energy level. Once the second energy level is full, we have to start filling the third energy level. Energy level 3 has three sublevels. They are called S, P, and D. But we will only study the S and P sublevels. These sublevels are arranged in the same way as energy level 2. The electrons in the 3s sublevel occupy a larger spherical space around the nucleus, while the electrons in the 3p sublevel occupy a larger dumbbell shaped space. Of course, these electrons have more energy, which allows them to be in the third energy level. Sulfur has an atomic number of 16. Remember, 
This means that it has 16 protons in the nucleus, and so it also has 16 electrons. Check that you can draw the energy level diagram and write down the electron configuration of a sulfur atom. Here is the energy level diagram for sulfur. Can you see that the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4? Notice that sulfur also has two unpaired electrons, just like oxygen, and the last part of their electron configuration is similar. Now, this is no coincidence. Sulfur and oxygen both belong to the same group of the periodic table. So far, we have only looked at the first three energy levels and filled the 3p sublevel. Strangely, the next sublevel to be filled is the 4s sublevel and not the 3d sublevel. This 3d sublevel has more energy than the lowest sublevel of the fourth energy level. So, we need to draw in the 4s sublevel after the 3p sublevel. The fourth energy level has s, p, d, and f sublevels, but we are only concerned with the s sublevel for the fourth energy level. Using this grid, you should now be able to fill in the energy level diagrams for atoms of the first 20 elements. There's one final link I want you to take note of. This quantum mechanical model was developed from complicated mathematics before any experimental work was done. After the theory was developed, experimental evidence was sought. It was at this point the work of the spectroscopists was re-examined. And here they found some amazing correlations. All the energy calculations matched. In fact, the reason the spherical orbital is called an S orbital is because these electrons produce sharp lines in the line emission spectra. The P orbital electrons form principal lines. The D orbital electrons diffuse lines. And the F orbital electrons, the fine lines in the line emission spectrum. At last, we have a model of the atom that seems to describe all the observations observed in the laboratory. Thanks, Diasha. This lesson has provided the skills to draw energy level diagrams for the first 20 elements in the periodic table and write out the spectroscopic electron configuration for the first 20 elements. Practice these skills by completing the task for this lesson in the task video. Also remember to visit the Mindset website www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye until next time.